there's just one message that the Lord asks us to preach, and that's the message of the kingdom. Every other thing comes alongside with it. Deliverance, prosperity, healing, whatever. They follow it. And if you check it properly, you find that he first asks them to go preach the kingdom, then those things will accompany the preaching of the kingdom. Amen? Yeah. So, we don't have to reverse the process. It's one mission with activities accompanying that same mission. Amen? I was trying to establish the fact that Jesus rose and got to his throne. And I think we saw that plainly from the scripture uh, to give us the conviction that Jesus is alive and is ruling and reigning on the throne of his father as prophesied uh, from especially in the book of Second Samuel chapter 7 verse number 12. Okay, um, I want to continue from there this morning. I'm going to read, uh, start with Luke chapter 21. I made mention of the fact that in Acts chapter 7, Jesus was seen standing up. And like I said, that is very significant if you need to understand what was about to happen when Stephen saw him standing. Instead of sitting, according to Hebrews 10, after he's finished, the, work, the scriptures say he sat down at the right hand of God. But here was Jesus standing when Stephen saw him. And so, there was a reason why he was standing. And like I said, he was standing because he was not coming forth for judgment unto Jerusalem because they crucified the innocent blood according to the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. And we said that before, that when innocent body is crucified, those who kill that innocent person must also face the judgment according to the law. So, they were saying, please, we don't want to hear about this because it's like you're accusing us before God and now judgment must come to us. Amen? All right. So, book of Luke chapter 21. Um, let's get this at the back of our mind as well. Luke was written in AD 63 and uh, Acts was between 62 and 63. And uh, we also need to understand that Luke wrote the book of Acts as well. Are, are we in agreement with that? All right, so let's get the dates right. Now, if that is the case, we must understand that what Luke is speaking about is something to come at a particular time in history. And it probably, definitely, too, wasn't talking about your time. Amen? Not your time. Now, I believe, you know, in terms of eschatological languages, we have what we call preterist. Uh, fulfill scriptures or scriptures fulfilled. I have no problem with that. I subscribe to so many of Preteri's uh, expositions. But I also believe in, if I may want to use the word, kingdom eschatology. By that I mean Christ is yesterday, today, and forever. And so what happened to people yesterday can happen to you today because it's the same word of God. So I don't believe that it is fulfilled, therefore it is gone. It can repeat itself. Because those things happen to them for an example unto us. So I am more into kingdom eschatology than just strict preteries. So get my views. Okay, Luke 21. I'm reading 20. <clears throat> and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. Let them that are in the countries enter therein unto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. All things which are written, you can get that from Daniel chapter 9. He was actually referring to Daniel chapter 9, 20 to 27, Zechariah 11 verse 1. All things we were written. He's saying they are about to be fulfilled now. So these are prophecy fulfilled. But woe unto them which are with child, and to them that give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrought upon these people. Now you know the story. I'm not going to read all of that for time's sake. But the issue I'm raising here now is everything that you can read from this chapter has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem. In AD 70. Jesus was giving them uh, what is going to happen in AD 70. But the key point I want you to see there in relation to what we are discussing this morning. Let's look at verse 28. Look at that. 
And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head for your redemption draw it nigh. Now, if you bring this to our days, we'll get into trouble. You have to understand that Jesus was speaking to the Jewish people and he was saying, when you see the Roman armies compile Jerusalem, which has to do with the destruction of the city in AD 70, when you see these things come to be, just know that your redemption is drawing near. Which also in the Amplified say, your deliverance is drawing near or has come. Now, read down and let me see something there. And he spoke to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the, uh, all the trees. When they know when they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own self that not the, the summer is nigh at hand. Likewise, look at that. So likewise, yeah, when you see this thing come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is at hand. In other words, as Jerusalem is coming down, there is an exposure of God's kingdom. The redemption drawing nigh that he was talking about is you have been delivered from the oppression of the law and the system that have held you captive. Because when the temple is destroyed, when the city is brought down, the Levitical priesthood is gone, and then the kingdom comes up. You are coming into a new order. That is now your redemption. You have been redeemed, you have been delivered from the oppression of the Jewish system of worship. And that's why I said, when you see this thing, you see the armies come, you see Jerusalem coming down, then know that the kingdom of God is at hand. So we can see that the kingdom really has begun long before now. It has already been there, fine. But maybe we say the inauguration of the new season of it. Is that alright? Okay. So let's move on now. And there was... Uh, Verse 32 says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all this thing be what? Be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Act chapter 1. When you see this thing begin to happen, you don't know, look at verse 6, the kingdom of God is at hand. Act 1, 6. And when the therefore has come together, they ask him, saying, Lord, without this time restore again the kingdom to Israel. I tried to explain that on Monday. They were not so much as confused, but were trying to say, because you see, Jesus didn't rebuke them for that question. He only told them, it's not for you to know the time or the season, whatever, in terms of the power that will come, like he was trying to explain to us. But the point here is, they understood that one of the major reasons Jesus came was to restore the house of Israel, which was divided. So then we had Judah, we had Israel. I mentioned that before. Samaria being the capital for Israel, and uh, Jerusalem being the capital for Judah. Two tribes during the division of Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Verse 7. And he said unto them, It's not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own power, but he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and he shall be witnesses unto me both in... Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and then the uttermost parts of the earth. Interesting. What was the witness going to be all about? Witness about me. Not just about Jesus, but about the king and his kingdom. Is that all right? Okay. If you want to take time to go through scriptures, you follow the way this. Uh, maybe we'll just jump some verses from here. I mean, on this place. If you go to Acts chapter 6, verse number 7. The Bible says, The word of God increased, and the number of the people or disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. Now, there was now a movement. Watch this. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. I, I, you need to get the progression. Are you, are you getting that? Okay, fine. So now the God, the Holy Spirit, Peter begin to speak, the holy person at the beautiful gate, in chapter 3, after chapter 4, after chapter 5, and Ananias and Sapphira died, 
so that God can bring God out to the church. Acts chapter 6, the movement continues. And the next thing you read there is the word of God, which basically is the kingdom message now. Are you getting that? Increased. And the number of disciples multiply in Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria. Okay. All right. And the Bible says, great company. And company there and priests and all that were obedient to it. Amen. Okay. Go to Acts chapter 8. Let's jump 7. 7. In Acts chapter 7 is where we have the Stephen being killed. Right. Okay. Now, Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Therefore, that they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Verse number 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. But when they believed Philip preaching the things, are you still there with me? Concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized both men and women. Hallelujah. So now it's gone to Samaria. Verse 14 says, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they went unto them, they sent unto them Peter and John. I'm just trying to see, make you see how this message began to move according to the instruction that Jesus gave. Amen? Okay. Now, before he came to Samaria, the neighboring Judea nation have already received the word. So he had moved from Jerusalem to the neighboring nation of Judea. He had not come to Samaria. Is that okay? Philip had to be there teaching the kingdom of God, doing signs and wonders and miracles, and people came. Like he was trying to say, I said it before. Some of the people ask me questions about some ministers in my country. What do you know about this man? What do you think about this man? As far as I'm concerned, it's not about what I think about anybody. The point is this. If what that man is doing is fake, I want the genuine one to come. When Philip went to Samaria, Simon the sorcerer was there. He didn't leave the message and begin to pursue Simon the sorcerer. He declared the message of the kingdom with power, with authority. People left Simon the sorcerer and joined Philip. That should be the order. Reveal the real thing. Man will come to you and forsake the fake. You are not called to go preach against the fake. You are called to preach the kingdom with power. And men will forsake the faith and come to you. If you go to Acts chapter 9, let just run. Reading from verse 1. Paul was converted. He was persecuting the, the church. Is that okay? Acts chapter 10. Colonius and his household Gentiles came into the fold. Are you there with me? Acts chapter 11. The brethren in Judea heard that the Gentiles have received the word. Peter narrated his story to the elders in Jerusalem. You see, the message is now moving according to what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. That's the progression. That's what I'm saying. Everything you see in the book of Acts was actually in relation to the restoration of Israel. Which is a kingdom that God promised to David. Your own son shall sit upon the throne. And this took place immediately after resurrection. So now the Gentiles are beginning to come in. So, um, after chapter 12, Herod killed James, Peter escaped. And then verse 24, the Bible says, But the word of God grew and multiplied. Herod is of Judea. You remember that? Praise the living God. Act 13. Paul showed up and sent for by the church. Went to the synagogue first because salvation is of the Jews. Jews first. That is why he went there. You know, after his conversion in Act chapter 9, you can never hear anything about him again until Act chapter 13. And as soon as he showed up, first place he went towards the temple. People said he was not supposed to be. No, 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 no. He had an understanding. That salvation was of the Jews. So the Jews must first receive the message before the Gentiles. That was his mindset. That's why he went there. Verse 46 of Acts 13 says, 
Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. But since you put it off from you and judge yourself unworthy of everlasting life, Lord, will turn to the Gentiles. Now from there, the rest of the region begin to receive the word. Are you following this? Okay. Now, Act 14, verse 6. There the Bible made us to understand they moved from Lystra to Derby and to the city of the Laconian. The Gentiles are coming in now. Uttermost parts, as the case may be. It's now receiving the word of the kingdom. Acts 16, verse 14. And a certain woman, Lydia, was brought in. She was a Gentile, as the case may be. Are you getting that now? Progression. The thing is just moving from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost part of the earth. So, in Acts 16, Lydia, the purple seller, was coming. And then, you know, she was living in Theatra. Amen? Then from there, it moved to Derbe, to Lystra, to Philippi. From where you have the jailer converted. Are you following the progression? Then Act 19, again the word says, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. In other words, what is happening here is the kingdom is expanding and there was no power to resist it. That's what it means. The world mightily prevailed. It's like a warfare and a conquering situation. The world was moving. No power can stop it. Even trying to put people in prison, Peter, or whatever, couldn't stop the world. The world keep on multiplying, the world keep on growing, and that's what we're talking about. So the kingdom was expanding in relation to what Jesus said, that this message of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and the end shall come. So when you look at that, I want to say something here a little bit. The world war there, Okonome, is not really talking about the globe. In context, it's not talking about the globe. I believe in interpreting scripture from one particular perspective as well, in addition to any other. I believe in what I call audience relevance. Audience relevance has to do with who is God talking to? Who is God addressing at this particular time? You first have to get that at the back of your mind before you apply the scripture even to yourself. So when he says this, the world was not then talking about the globe. For instance, in Luke chapter 2, verse 1, tells us precisely how Caesar made a decree that the whole world should be taxed in their own city. Was Caesar ruling Africa at that time? Not at all. The world has to do with wherever there was a Jewish man, in fact, if you are not within the Jewish setting, you are not in the world. So, it referred then to the Greek Roman Empire. That was the world. Okay, I'll give you a scripture to prove that. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, 6 and then 23. Look at it. It said, which come unto you as it is in all the world, and bring it forth fruit as it is as it close you in you, since the day ye heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 20, 23. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, wherefore I, Paul, am made a minister. When did the gospel go to every creature under heaven? Are we saying, even in South Africa here now, there are no communities that have never heard this gospel? We're talking of rural areas and deep, deep into interiors. People are still there. In my country, in the middle bed, there are people there, the common people. It's not quite long that they heard about the gospel. So when you say every creature, it's making reference to the Jewish setting of people. Is that all right? Okay. Let me give you another scripture here. Romans 1. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Which world? Faith of Roman believers. The Christians in Rome. Say their faith is being spoken of all over the world. Did you hear anything about them before? No. Hallelujah. Praise the living God. So, 
I tried to say this for you to understand how the world moved. Right from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. And remember what Jesus said. Even Moses. And he said, if I have to scatter you all over the four corners of the world, I will bring you back. Where were the Jews scattered into? I don't know if there was any hiding here in Africa when God was speaking. No. We're talking about when they went into captivity. Babylon, Assyria, and whatever. That is the end of the world in terms of contextually speaking. Hallelujah. The reality of it is, it's not just the restoration of the kingdom or the nation of Israel. It's coming to a spiritual dimension. That is why the Gentiles were now brought in. You remember the argument that came up in Jeremiah, I mean, in Acts chapter 15? What they were saying, the Gentiles, they need to be circumcised, whatever. And then here, James stood up and said, well, if what Peter have said, then we got the fulfillment of Amos chapter 9, the restoration of the tabernacle of David. And that's why I always say, um, restoration of the tabernacle of David is not necessarily uh, worship or music. Uh, that's inclusive. But the true sense of it, when Amos made a prophecy, he was saying, the Gentiles who were not priests, will be brought into the fold that they also become kings and priests. The Melchizedek order. The point was, David erected his own tabernacle behind his house with the ark when he brought it from Obedenot's house. And there was no priest that was worshipping before the ark. He was ministering before the ark. But that was the duty of a priest. So David was now a priest king. So because he was a priest king, we are now prince and king through the blood of Jesus. Is that okay? But that is to say we were not qualified to minister before the hour because we were not Levitical in order. So David actually initiated the Melchizedek order. That's what he means, the restoration of the tabernacle of David. And because it was restored, like we find in Acts chapter 15, you are now qualified now to minister before God. Are we together? Okay, so now the kingdom has to do now with spiritual reality. It's not a matter of Levitical order now. It's not a matter of just, uh, you know. And you see, something you need to know also is Samaria went into crazy worship through Jeroboam. Because to him, there was no need for those in Samaria to go to Jerusalem to worship. So he was ordaining all manner of people as priests. Is that okay? So a form of idolatry came in, all manner of things came into the system. Now God was bringing these people back together. Like I said before, Ezekiel had to prophesy holding two sticks and joining the two sticks in his hand, which is the house of Judah and the house of Samaria. Is that okay? Right. Even Exodus, I mean Ezekiel 37, the dry bones have to do with the house of Israel. If you read the whole story down, the restoration of the house of Israel, which speaks of resurrection. And that's what you find in in John chapter 5, when he said, those who hear my voice, they shall leave. He's talking about the house of Israel coming back. We can apply that definitely to ourselves. That when we hear his voice, we can leave. But spiritually, I mean, intentionally, God was speaking to the house of Israel. In relation to the prophecy of Ezekiel, of the dry bones. Are we together? Okay, so the kingdom now is spiritual. So, just like he said, let's look at it again. Matthew twelve twenty eight. Uh, now, he was doing signs and wonders, casting out miracles, and then people say, well, you're using the spirit of devils, you, you, you are bezable, whatever the case may be. Fine. 28, the Bible says, but if I cast a devil by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. So simple. Amplify puts it this way. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out the demons, then the kingdom of God has come unto you before you expected it. Amen? When the Bible says the kingdom of God is within you, it's not really talking about then within the Pharisees because they were the one opposing him. But he was trying to say, I am the personification of the kingdom. I'm living among you. That was then. But today, because he is now in us, we can take that scripture to say the kingdom of God is within us because he rules from within. But when he said in the book of Luke, 
he was making reference to the Pharisees. I am the personification of the kingdom. I'm standing among you, but you don't accept me and you don't believe me. Hallelujah. Do you have the Holy Spirit? We all said yes. Do you have power? And also we said yes. <laughs> Amen. So now, do you have the Holy Spirit? The answer says yes. So do you have the kingdom? The answer should be yes. Because the Spirit carries the kingdom. Okay, let's get down to Romans 14. Popular scripture. Look at this. Romans 14, verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It says, for he that in this thing served Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. But the key point is, the kingdom is not meat and drink. What do you mean not meat and drink? Initial time I was thinking, well, he's saying, well, <laughs> I remember one of my friends in the U.S. He almost died. Because he's studying, he's taking yogurt, he's drinking this. He's, why is it, ah, the kingdom is not about food, man. You can eat. Had a heart attack, got a high level of cholesterol and all of that. And then he came to preach a message, discipline yourself. <laughs> now I realize it's not about food. Is that okay? But because he was trying to say, once you're in the kingdom, you nothing, everything goes. But that's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about food. And again, when you say it's not meat and drink, it's not as if he's saying you have to be poor man to be in the kingdom. You see, because it's, it's kind of made us to understand God will give you all things. He will sacrifice his son. How is it that he will withhold all things from us? And then even in the book of Matthew, he tells us precisely, seek the kingdom, all these things shall be added.